lecture outline five. This is a lecture outline entirely about gases and the gas phase. And we're gonna start with an example from an article I pulled from the New York Times about how higher temperatures affect flying of airplanes. So depending upon the temperature, uh, there is, as temperature increases, a uh, sparser set of air molecules in the gas phase in air, meaning that their uh, gas molecules are farther apart. And this leads to less lift for the airplane. And it means that either the plane has to be going faster. And in some circumstances, uh, what the point of this article was that in Arizona, the temperature had gotten to about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is a high enough temperature that the plane is not allowed to take off, uh, certain planes anyway, that need a certain amount of lift uh, in order to take off. So flights were canceled, and this was from 2017 in particular, and it was uh, a, a large number, larger than uh, had uh, been seen before, larger number of flights had to be canceled due to high temperatures. So the properties of gases are important. I mean, we breathe gases, so gases show up in a lot of different places. Gases are also the simplest phase because the particles, the molecules, the atoms are so far apart. Now, let's talk about the structure of a gas. A gas, gases are composed of particles that are flying around very fast in their containers. And, in the out more space there. Uh, the particles travel in straight lines until they encounter either the container wall or another particle, then they bounce off. And there is a lot of space between the gas particles. And uh, first note I wanna say right here, uh, well, let's see, let's actually make it note number three. So remember, our picture of a gas has 10 diameters between gas particles. So that's our picture of a gas, and I just so happen to have a ruler here, and that means that if I make a uh, gas particle that has a diameter of one centimeter, then uh, pretty close to one centimeter, then the next one has to be way over here. So that is 10 centimeters away. And what I've noticed is that from the first uh, lecture outline where I drew you a picture of a gas and then on the homework assignments, uh, we tend to put our gas particles much closer than 10 diameters. Um, and uh, so maybe we're drawing compressed gases, but uh, I want you to think of all of this space in here. Um, and then down here would be 10 centimeters, be almost, we're off the page. There's a lot of space. Um, now as an example, for argon uh, gas at zero degrees Celsius and room pressure, which just means the pressure in the room, and we'll talk about what that is in a couple minutes, 0.01% uh, of the volume of the gas is particles. Zero point zero one percent of the volume of the gas is particles. Those could be molecules or atoms, or in this case, since it's argon gas, it would be atoms. So ninety nine point nine nine percent percent of the volume of this gas is empty space. meaning that even though there is gas in this room, that uh, most of the space in here is empty space between the gas particles. And uh, now it's time for a demonstration. And here is me walking through a gas phase.
Now you can't do that for a liquid or a solid phase, so here's me walking through a solid phase. You just can't do it. And that's because in the solid phase, the particles are much closer together. It is much more dense. In fact, a uh, good rule of thumb is that uh, a gas has approximately one one thousandth of the density of a solid a gas uh, density is one one thousandth uh, solid density okay and that's why you can walk through gas um, uh, there are other things too, like the gas particles will move and get out of your way as you move through them too. Um, good. Um, so this, all of this information, this explains why gases have, uh, this all the space explains why gases have low density. Uh, for gases. Now, as gas particles move and strike a surface, they push on that surface. If we could measure the total amount of force exerted by the gas molecules hitting a surface at any one instant, we would know the pressure the gas is ex exerting. And so here's my next demonstration. Here is a gas phase hitting a surface. Of course, my hands are much bigger than gas molecules. Uh, but you get the idea. Anything that hits a surface is going to create a pressure. And um, two, uh, so we would know the pressure. Two is going to be uh, a definition of pressure. So pressure is a force per area. And so when I was striking my desktop, uh, I had a certain amount of force and it was in a certain amount of area and if I were to do the same thing except with the tip of my finger there would be much more pressure so if I had the same force coming down um, on a smaller area I would have much more pressure on that surface okay and so remember we drew the collisions with the wall of a gas phase molecule. And in a very real way, though we cannot see the gas particles striking the surface, in a very real way, that's how uh, pressure is created on surfaces through uh, billions of collisions per second. Uh, so billions uh, of collisions per second. Probably more than that. So let's write at least billions of collisions per second. So even though each gas particle is relatively small, get enough of them together, it creates a measurable pressure. Um, now, uh, let's see. I think we have one more thing to say, one or two things more to say here. So uh, what I'd like to cover next is what makes an ideal gas. And there will be two things in particular that I want to mention because we're going to be talking about a lot about ideal gases. So the first thing is for an ideal gas, um, there are, so each particle takes no volume. And I'll just write each particle takes zero volume. And on the last page, we talked about how each particle takes a very tiny amount of the volume of the container. But in the limit of an ideal gas, each particle takes a zero volume. And each particle has zero attraction for other particles.
each particle has zero attraction for other particles or the walls of the container. Okay, and so these two things will uh, make an ideal gas. And it's true in general that each particle takes very little volume and that each particle has very little attraction for the other particles. Um, and statement two is equivalent to saying that uh, gas particles have uh, zero intermolecular forces. and my abbreviation for intermolecular forces was IMF. Gas particles have zero IMF as uh, an ideal gas, and they act as if they have very little or negligible IMF um, in general as well. Anyway, we'll talk more about what makes an ideal gas um, shortly. Now, measuring air pressure, this is something we can do. This is something that, uh, that has been done for hundreds of years we measure the effect of particle collisions with the walls of the container or on a surface. And one way to do this, and more or less the original way of doing it was with a, a measuring air pressure was with a barometer. For a barometer, um, there is going to be a, um, so we have a, a glass tube and there's a vacuum up here. You initially fill the glass tube with uh, mercury, liquid mercury, and then put your finger over it and put it inside the pool of liquid mercury on the bottom. Then what happens is the mercury level adjusts and, and uh, leaves behind a vacuum in the top. And uh, what we have here is in a barometer that um, first off, that there's air colliding with the surface of the mercury, creating pressure. Air particles. colliding with the surface of the liquid mercury and creating pressure. And here in the vacuum, in the tube, in the glass tube, there is a vacuum There are no air particles and no pressure. Okay. And so there's pressure pushing down on the liquid pool of mercury. There's no pressure pushing down on the mercury in the tube. And so since there's a pressure difference, that's going to push the mercury up the tube. So no pressure, air pressure pushes the mercury up the tube. So these two push the liquid mercury up the tube. Okay. Um, and then what you might say is, well then why isn't the tube completely full? Well, uh, we also have, right, and that's the atmospheric pressure we're showing here that I just described. Um, the mercury is pulled down by gravity. So the liquid mercury is pulled down by gravity. And it's pulled down pretty hard because the density of liquid mercury is 13.6 grams per milliliter. So 13.6 times more than water. So gravity acts strongly 
on the mercury. But even so, so the uh, air pressure is able to push the mercury up the tube and against gravity for 760 millimeters or 29.92 inches. That's quite high. So a mercury barometer actually is a pressure or force balance between pressure on the outside pushing it up, then uh, gravity pulling it down. Okay. And uh, this 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to what's called one atmosphere. Uh, which is abbreviated ATM for atmosphere. So, uh, and that is the uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level, and it is a definition. Now, as far of units of as far uh, as units of pressure, we can see the atmosphere here, and it is exactly equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury in atmospheres tend to be the two most common units of pressure that I use in my class. Um, you'll also see tor, and a tor is defined as uh, in honor of Torricelli, one of the first scientists working with gases. One tor equals one millimeter of mercury. That's why these two numbers are the same. Um, pounds per square inch, we run into that quite often with tires. Um, and I want to point out that uh, one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. And so that means if I take my arm and I think of a one inch square area, air is pounding down on that with a pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch. So atmospheric pressure, that is a serious amount of pressure. In fact, it's what keeps our skin on our bones. That pressure pushes down. When you go into space, if you should be lucky enough to go into space, um, the, what happens is there is no or very little air pressure and your skin begins to puff out because there is no pressure holding it down. And my understanding, or what I like to think, not my understanding, what I like to think, is that that's why on Star Trek they wear spandex suits is to hold their skin to apply that pressure that they don't have in space. Who knows? Now, um, none of these units that I've gone over, and let me get back to that slide, none of these units that I've gone over are the SI unit of pressure. Uh, the SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, and uh, a bar is defined as it looks like 100 pascals. Uh, we will occasionally use these units. Uh, you'll find that most of the units you need are on the uh, conversions and equations sheet. We have atmospheres to PSI, millimeters of mercury to tor, to bar. And so uh, use this when you're solving problems uh, and or um, on the homework or quizzes or exams. As an example, a high performance bicycle tire has a pressure of 132 PSI. What is the pressure in millimeters of mercury? So we go back to that last slide. We see that 14.7 pounds per square inch, and that is not exact. You can see it's got a decimal place in it. Um, that, that is not exact, but the three sig figs were okay. 14.7 PSI and is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Times 760 divided by 14.7. I get 6,824. Uh, I'm going to put that in scientific notation. 6.82 times 10 to the third millimeters of mercury. 
Letter E is a companion problem. And then I'd like to say one other thing about how to measure pressures, and that's not necessarily uh, for the atmosphere, that's for uh, measuring the pressure of gases. Manometers uh, are U-shaped tubes partially filled with a liquid connected to a, the gas sample on one side and open to the air on the other. An open-ended manometer is open to the atmosphere and measures the pressure difference between the pressure of a gas and atmospheric pressure. So I'm, show, uh, I'm showing an open-ended manometer and the gas is going to be mercury and the pressure here is a capital P and it is of the air pressure or the atmospheric pressure and it is also sometimes referred to as the external pressure or total pressure. So there's lots of ways for designating pressure right there. But it's the air pressure, and uh, what you can do is with a, a barometer, you can measure the air pressure or the atmospheric pressure. And if the gas and the air have equal levels, equal levels of mercury, then what we can say is that the pressure of the air equals the pressure of the gas. Okay. And uh, so that way we can know um, what the gas pressure is. And these are subscripts down here. All of these are capital P for pressure, uh, subscript for what kind of pressure it is. Now quickly, uh, let me sketch over here. A slightly different situation, so here's my valve, here's my gas, uh, and now my liquid mercury level is higher in the portion exposed to the air, and I'll crosshatch this in. and this is still mercury in the tube. My question for you is, does the gas or the air have a higher pressure? You can think of the fact that the gas is pushing down and is able to push the gas down, or the mercury down farther. So the first thing we can say about this is that the pressure of the gas is greater than the pressure of the air. And in fact, if we measure this height, Since it's a height of mercury, we measure it in millimeters of mercury. We can determine the pressure of the gas precisely. The pressure of the gas is going to be equal to the pressure of the air plus the height in millimeters of mercury. like so. And this kind of analysis would also allow us to think about if the uh, uh, liquid mercury level were higher towards the gas phase inside the bulb, then the pressure of the gas would be lower than the pressure of the air, and we would have to add the height in the liquid mercury to the other side. 